Hmm. Oh, lots of tough questions today. Here's one from Basil. I live in constant worry. My children are going to be hit by a car, kidnapped, murdered, beaten up. It's a torture. How can I stop? Well, I guess the first thing I would say is that you should reassure yourself, and I know that's a paradoxical way to think about it, that these things could happen. You know, look, I've never been surprised as a clinician that people were anxious. So what you say doesn't surprise me, except that the constancy part of it perhaps is surprising. Because children can get hit by cars, kidnapped, murdered, and beaten up. Um, and it is a torture to contemplate that. And so you might ask yourself, not Basil, not why so much you're living in constant worry that that could happen to your children, but why everyone else isn't always living in constant worry that that could happen. You know, because tragedy can strike and it strikes children and apparently you're quite attached to your children and so aren't very, what would you say, soothed by the realization that something terrible could happen to them. Now, you know, first of all, I might say, you might want to go talk to somebody professional about this, you know, because maybe you're depressed more than you should be, and maybe you have an anxiety disorder. Um, I'm not saying that. That is not a diagnosis, and I certainly couldn't derive that from what you said, but it's one of the possible things that could contribute to this constant worry, you know, or, or maybe you're physiologically ill and less resilient than you should be. Maybe you're not eating enough. Um, one thing I would recommend to begin with is to make sure that you just try this. I know it's surprising advice, but try to eat a big breakfast for like two weeks. See what happens. See if that drives the worry down. Now, then the next thing I would ask is when does it happen? Like, is it, are these dreams? Are these thoughts before you go to bed? Do you wake up in the middle of the night with these visions running through your head? Um, and again, this has to do with food. Is it more likely to happen if you're hungry? That's for something worth checking out because the next time you get worried in the middle of the day, you might try eating something. I would recommend something high protein, high fat rather than high carbohydrate. And just see if that helps because that might indicate that some of your worry is a consequence of hyperglycemia. And that's a lot more common than people think. So if it's dreams and visions at night, you know, one of the things you can do that's counterproductive is take one of those fantasies that's torturing you, you know, and that you're, you're suppressing, because you will be suppressing it, and let it play itself out. You see, what's happening is that the parts of your mind, the parts of your brain, the parts of your psyche that are al alarm systems, so that's the anxiety systems, are they're trying to think something through, and they're using fantasy to think it through, right? And so this is actually a form of thought that's torturing you, because it's reasonable for the parts of your brain that are on the outlook for negative occurrences to think, well, what if, what if, what if? That's what thinking is. And sometimes you think positively, what if, and sometimes you think negatively. And well, you're in all likelihood doing everything you can to escape from these thoughts when they make themselves manifest. But all that does is make the systems that are producing those thoughts even more likely to produce them because now they think, the alarm system thinks, oh, well, here's a danger, which is basically the vulnerability of children. And I'm trying to present um, the active agent, the person who I inhabit with evidence of this potential threat as a good alarm system should. And it turns out that they're so afraid of the message that I'm delivering that they won't even listen to it Therefore, the situation must be much more dire than I supposed, and I'm going, to I'm going to have to amplify and increase the emotion of my statement and the repetitiveness of the thought. And so that's just not helpful at all, right? Because what you've done is you've taken a worry and you've now recategorized it as a worry that's so terrible that you won't even think about it. 
And so now the alarm systems think that you're being chased by he who can't be named. That's a good way of thinking about it and a good allusion to something popular in culture. And so they're just going to be screaming nonstop. So what do you have to do? Well, man, this is counterproductive, but I'll tell you, it works. Next time you have a, there's a couple of things you could do. You could start by bringing to mind those fantasies. Sit down somewhere, take some deep breaths, try to calm yourself down a little bit, and let those thoughts come forward. You know what they are. And then watch them like you're watching a movie. Even if it's a horror movie, watch them. Let the whole fantasy play out and see what, what comes out at the end. Now, at, at, even if it's, it's going to be frightening to do this. Now, look, even if the vision is quite horrific, right? The entire thought is quite horrific. You have now indicated to your anxiety systems that you have enough courage to face the worrisome event. And just that alone should be helpful. Now, you may have to do this multiple times, and you might have to do it with all the thoughts. And you'll know that you're, you know that you'll have done it, you'll know that you've done it enough when doing it starts to become mundane, when all the emotion goes out of it. And if you're particularly frightened, that might take a long time. Now, the other thing that you might really consider and this is something you can do as an adjunct, is you should think about what you would do if this would happen, if this happened, you know, as if it happened in real life. And, and to take even the worst case situation, you know, so let's say, let's say that you received the news that your child would was hit by a car. Well, you know, you could receive news like that. And then the question is, well, what would you do and what you what should you do? And the answer is, you don't know. You think that that would kill you. You think that that would be unbearable and, and the end of the world. And it's not surprising that you think that, but it's not helpful, you know, because people have to live through catastrophe and you have more than one child, apparently, and I would presume as well that you have a spouse and other people that love you and need you. And so it isn't good that you would fall apart and die like in an, in an apocalyptic dread if something happened to one of the people that you loved, because then you would leave all the other people bereft of you as well. And that's not helpful. And so if your child was hit by a car, well, what would you do? Well, you have to think it through. You know, you'd grieve. You'd go to the hospital. You'd have a terrible time. You'd have a terrible year, you know. And, and that would be that. And you'd have the funeral and you'd have the loss of the child. And all of that would be awful. But people live through that, you know, and maybe you could have a name. A name would be that if that happened, your determination would be to live through it so that you could be there for the rest of your people and so that you wouldn't fall apart and collapse because the death of someone and the subsequent utter collapse of a person closely associated with them, that, that second event does not improve the first one. It makes it worse. And it's incumbent upon you to develop the psychological strength to be able to tolerate what it is that your anxiety alarm systems are tormenting you with. And, you know, you might think, well, that's impossible. But, you know, it's not impossible because people live through catastrophe. And they do that in large part, or in no small part, by, by discovering that there are darker and stronger forces within them than they might be willing to appreciate. And that one of the consequences of integrating those forces is that you have the strength and the cruelty, in some strange sense, to endure, right, to dare continue to live, even if the unthinkable happens. And it's no simple matter to think of that as a moral step forward. But, you know, people are called upon to be strong and strong in the face of the worst catastrophe. And your psyche is tormenting you with precisely that. You know, it won't let you go. It'll shake you like a dog shakes a rat. 
It won't let you go until you deal with it. You deal with mortality, even the mortality of your children. And you find within you what would allow you to withstand that, damaged or not, to withstand that. And you do that by letting yourself go where your thoughts take you, even though you don't want to. That's a trip into the abyss. You know, that's a trip into the underworld. And those are best taken voluntarily. You're being dragged down there by forces that are beyond your control. And the mythological motif is that those who are pulled into the underworld by forces beyond their control do not come out, not come out easily. It can be the end, you know. So you go there courageously. And so if you're a parent, one of the places you have to go courageously is to that place where your children are ill or dying or deceased. You have to do that. You haven't grown up until you have done that, even though it's a terrible thing. So that's how you could deal with that. It's rough, man. But I'll tell you, it's a lot better than living in constant worry that your children are going to be hit by a car, kidnapped, murdered, or beaten up. So, you know, you're like, you're in a situation that characterizes the situation of many people in life. You don't have a good choice. You've got two rough choices. You could go left, and that's rough, and you can go right, and that's rough, and that's all you've got. And I would say you have the freedom to choose which of the two difficult paths you're going to choose, and the one that involves voluntary confrontation with what tortures and torments you, with the terrible predator of death, that's the pathway that's going to lead back to the stability that not only you need, but that your family requires you to have. So that's that. Man, you guys, you're asking tough questions tonight. 